when we are doing the will of our true self we are inevitably doing the will of the universe in magic these are seen as indistinguishable that every human soul is in fact one human soul it is the soul of the universe itself and as long as you are doing the will of the universe then it is impossible to do anything wrong So the Heather Weirdos and Witches, it is I, Keats Ross, host of Prag Magic and the self-appointed revelator of the Portland, Oregon art religion and art collective, We the Hallow. And, oh, I'm here with Zaro, a familiar gifted to me straight from Pacate herself. I not only wanted to take this time to introduce this week's guest, Vanessa Kendall, a paragon of Sumerian witchcraft, a true guiding light when it comes to the first tether the source the root of most western esotericism and uh, what i'm starting to do before every episode before i release is to try to divine using an oracle deck a custom arcana that the art collective we the hallowed has just released. It's designed by Eric J. Millar. It is called the Disruption Generator. You can find all the information at disruptiongenerator.com where you can purchase a portable one for your bibliomancy needs. It's 120 of the most beautiful, chaotic, brilliant illustrations, randomized, completely free of academic abundance and just straight to the point divination and the reason why i not only bring this up to help you know the pre-orders is you can get a hardcover coffee table type book um, for fifty dollars all of that will be down below but what i've been doing is using the disruption generator as uh episode art from here on out until i reach all 120 but i do that by divining a card And for this week, I was able to divine complicated. Now, the definition for the disruption generator is complexity and confusion, a dearth of choices on a splintered pathway. And I cannot tell you just how brilliant that uh, symbolizes what Sumerian witchcraft is in my mind, because it is a dearth of different pathways being the uh, the source, the root, as you can see, if you're watching, it's illustrated as roots. So without further ado, let's just jump into the brilliant Vanessa Kindle and my conversation where she talks about how Sumerian witchcraft has shaped her art, how she used it to fight tornadoes in Ohio, those pesky 23 tornadoes that came and ravaged Ohio and how she uses it to form her day, her personal practice, and her art. So, Zara and I thank you for putting up with this, for listening to me. Pick up the Disruption Generator, disruptiongenerator.com. Check out our art collective, wethehallowed.org. And Slither Hither Weirdos and Witches, here is my interview with Vanessa Kimball. And that's what I wanted to get into because it's such like i'm not the word isn't niche you know but it's such a focused like path and i wanted to know what was the trajectory like how did you get into sumerian um so we, we've started already yeah want to just jump into it <laughs> okay <laughs> so, i'm used to like somebody saying and we're live <laughs> oh let's do it yeah so this is my trial by fire with video so forgive the unprofessional <laughs> aspects well just real quick this is vanessa kindle you're like a uh like i said a paragon of sumerian witchcraft is that uh too much of a colloquial term 
No, I mean, that's applicable. I mean, in, uh, I mean, the, uh, oh, there that's you go. What, the, what the, uh, the academic sphere calls it, so. <laughs> cool. And yeah, that was Babylonian, so you're, you're a bit older than that. Yeah, well, see, the, the Babylonians are to the Sumerians what the Romans are to the Greeks. So it's like part right. of the same current, but they have their own twist and they, you know, some of the stuff like the Sumerians hadn't yet come up with, like, like astrology wasn't really a proper thing into the Babylonians. They were more or less the ones who invented it. There's bits and pieces here and there in the Sumerian, but it wasn't really formalized into the Babylonian. So for anything related to that, you pretty much have to go to the Babylonian sources and especially since more of those survived a lot of this stuff is you have to kind of like look at b what bits and pieces remain of the sumerian and then compare it to the babylonian to fill in the gaps yeah i heard you mention there's just like clay tablets basically that have yeah i mean there's still have yet to be fully deciphered even right yeah there's a lot of like the british museum alone has like 2000 and something in their archive that and of which like only a tiny fraction have actually been translated. Yeah. Yeah. I heard you mention that. And what people, people only were able to kind of decipher words here and there. So there was a lot of conjecture uh, up until recently. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, especially early on. I mean, it's been kind of a case of th the Sumerian language is very much like Chinese in that there's a bajillion different characters and worse in that, like there can be characters that are used for entirely different things just depending on the context. Right. So like every word can either be a verb or a noun and they don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Yeah. That's amazing. So and like the, the verb form of it could be something completely unrelated. So you have something that it, it means like water or rushing forward. And it's like, what <laughs> so yeah. you have to understand the context so like the sumerian language is kind of complicated which just adds to the difficulty of translation and of course you know it's been a case of working backwards because they found a rosetta stone ish tablet written in old uh, i think it was old uh persian and Babylonian, and then the, they have the Babylonians, they had a lot of Sumerian dictionaries, so it's kind of like working backwards yeah, through totally. the languages. So yeah, it's, it's I'm sorry, definitely go ahead. been an uphill battle, but I mean, I'm not involved in the actual translation. Right. I mean, I've been slowly learning the language, but you know, I'm not a, I'm not an academic. I'm working on a book, but like, you know, I've never actually gone to school for it or anything. It's just entirely been my own personal study. Hey, that's almost worth more to me, you know? <laughs> Instead of being told what to look into, you're finding it yourself. Yeah. So let's talk about your trajectory into this because this is like, like I said, it would be, it's a very distinct venture. It's almost like, did you have kind of a background in other kind of esoteric ideologies so beforehand? So I started with Wicca, actually, uh -huh. um, and I was working through the Cunningham material. And at right. some point, it gets to a point where you try to find your patron god and goddess, and there's some exercises in there to do that. Well, I did that, and I didn't get any of the ones that it like exp like says that you're supposed most likely going to get. Instead, I got Inanna. Oh, cool! And she came over, came through in such a big way that it like dwarfed everything else I had been doing, and it, it was like so much more intense and so much more powerful for me that I just completely lost interest in Wicca. I mean, yeah. it, I slowly moved away from it. It wasn't like overnight, but like pretty early on, I was like, I want something that's a lot more ancient and more authentic from a historical standpoint. And was this the uh, the direction I've been moving? Yeah more and more as time goes on. I was going to ask, because you had mentioned uh, on a podcast I've listened to that uh, you were visited by kind of a dragon. I think you described it as Falcor-esque from The NeverEnding Story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that was actually a little bit later. So Anana came through first. Uh -huh. And then, then I kind of, then I had this dream. Um, and at the time I had thought it was Anana that was in well, I, I'm not even sure it's a dream. It was one of those hypnagogic, you like you wake up, but you're not really awake 
or are you, but you wake up again kind of things. Totally. Where like you wake up, but there's like fantastic things and then you wake up again. Um, so it was one of those. And at the time I thought it was Inanna. I've now come to the conclusion it was the Hindu goddess Durga. But she said, live your Thelema. And that made me interested to looking into the Thelema. So for a little bit of time, I was kind of working through Thelema, but like giving it kind of a Sumerian twist. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was working through that and I was, I got kind of obsessed with Crowley's The Book of Lies. And I had kind of designed a meditation based around the concepts in that book of poetry. And that culminated in a out of body experience slash void experience right? where I met Tiamat and what I would now describe as the Abzu. And so was this, were you able to kind of corroborate, corroborate these experiences afterwards? Cause like I know with, uh, I've had experiences where I in these states have met with beings or deities that I would later find out to be correlating to things, you know, correlating to certain ones. I knew about Tiamat before I had the experience, but I didn't know what she looked like. I had only like read the texts that describe her um, and they don't really describe her. They just kind of like explain what her domain is and what she does. Um, but what is her domain? Um, well, the Abzu and chaos. Wow. She's kind of the force of chaos at the dawn of the universe. And she's like the mother of like half the gods. Um, her Sumerian name, which I didn't know at the time, is Namu. And that's kind of the one I tend to prefer calling her now, um, except in the context of the experience because she introduced herself to me as Tiamat. I think because that was the name I knew. <laughs> oh, right. So, yeah, it's like uh, speaking to you in a language you could understand almost. Right. And so how she appeared to me in the Abzu was – you know, I, I use Falcor to describe it because that kind of gives you the like the the overall body shape, but okay. it 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 was more dragon esque than that, more scaly. Um, definitely the color was like that, but but more like if you picture, have you ever seen an albino snake sure. with like when it's like kind of having freshly crawled out of its like shed its skin so it's still kind of oily and so it kind of looks rainbowy mm-hmm. that's how it looked how her skin looked Very um cool. and but her shape i later found a i think it was a cylinder seal with a depiction of her on it and it looked she looked exactly like that she was just in you know a different position but like she looked exactly like that so it was kind of a to me um it was kind of a, a proof in the pudding kind of thing. Right. A, uh, a verification of what I had seen to, to see it in stone like that. Very cool. I wanted to ask you too about uh, if you could describe the process of reaching this state, a little bit about the ritual. Um, it was mostly I was – So it was a meditation. I was practicing some meditation exercises that I had gotten from some Buddhist texts that I had been reading. And I think one of them was the Sutra on the Full Awareness of Breathing. Um, Well, specifically Thich Nhat Hanh's commentaries on that. And a couple things that I had pulled out of the penguin... Uh, What is it? Hold on. Let me actually grab it. It's right here. Um, Something I had pulled out of the Penguin Classics edition of the Buddhist scriptures. Um, I don't remember which one it was. I just kind of flipped through. (laughs) Is there a lot of... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. um, So so anyways, um, so I used the techniques that I got from those texts, but the actual meditation was on the concept of nothingness, of void, of like the space like like empty space yeah and like the the concept of non-existence and that was seemed to be what sparked it yeah because i was gonna 
I was I was thinking when you were talking, you brought up the Buddhist correlation, and you had mentioned before, like you had used the term "hungry ghost," uh, describing one of the gods, or like it's like what did you call it? Post human, I think was the term you used, which I really loved. <laughs> um, I don't think that I described the gods that way, but definitely no, there no. are spirits. Um, yeah. I'm trying to where did I put it? There yeah, because that was my introduction, um, you know, it's the actually, for the dead. And... Yeah, a Hungry Ghost is one of the uh, types of spirits that are listed in the... So I have right here, it's called the Witchcraft Series Malclu. Uh, Malclu, always mispronounce that. Um, it's actually a Babylonian uh, exorcism text. And it's oh, right. really long. It's, it's more of a collection of them all kind of stacked up on top of each other. Mm-hmm. It very much reminds me of the uh, Headless Rite. I and was I, just going to ask you about that. <laughs> I actually used it to kind of construct my own Mesopotamian version of the Headless Rite. Um, among other tablets, it wasn't the only source. But in any case, one of the things that are, one of the types of spirits that are mentioned multiple times is hungry ghosts. Because the idea was that if you're when your ancestors died, if, if they weren't buried exactly perfectly or if they were like jerks in life and re- therefore rejected from entering the gates of the underworld, um, then they would just kind of wander the earth as a hungry ghost. And that's where you get a lot of like of the weirder kinds of illnesses as well as like misfortune in your life. Um, also um, some poltergeist type, things in some contexts um uh, sleep paralysis type things in some contexts right. and other such things and so like concern about ensuring that a hungry ghosts in your family were taken care of and so that there came a lot of ancestor worship and like leaving altars out for your your dead relatives and stuff with like food and drink offerings and, and all that sort of stuff um but also to um you know kick out the hungry ghosts that aren't in your family that might be messing with you and that sort of thing is there yeah i was you know wondering about the synchronous kind of rites that are maybe even stemmed from sumerian because i'm i'm guessing that that's the tether really is is sumerian witchcraft has those you know tentacles and everything or are, that's where the archetypes come from you know definitely a lot of stuff in the um, westerns anything that goes through the uh, greek and roman uh heritage that's not really the right word i'm trying to think of the word that i'm trying to use uh, anything that goes th- current there's the word i was looking for anything that goes through that current originally comes from sumer i mean the greeks learned their astrology from Babylon. They yeah. actually traveled there to learn it. And then of course claimed credit for it because they always did that. But uh, I mean, and most of the Greek pantheon is actually Greek adaptations of Babylonian deities, which of course Babylonian are to the Sumerians. Um, you know, they're, they're a version of the Sumerians. So, um, and the Babylonians influenced a lot of people. There's, elements of that in the hebrew scriptures there's elements of that in gnosticism there's elements of that cross back and forth with egypt so there's some egyptian deities that were imported into the pantheon such as Bess, um and there were some sumerian deities that got imported into the in the egyptian pantheon sometimes through other vectors so like they would become popular in a nearby civilization and then that civilization would send it to Egypt. So mm-hmm. for example, um, Inanna through the vector of Asherah, which was the her name in the Canaanite pantheon, which they kind of changed some of her attributes. Um, but she got imported into the Greek, into the Egyptian or, or was it Astarte? I think that was the Persian name for her. Um, it, it gets it kind of gets complicated and mixed and matched and stuff um, as it goes throughout the line, but certainly um, the a whole huge mess of the stuff that we see in all sorts of pagan paths definitely connect to Sumerian or or share have a shared heritage because like pretty much any of the proto Indo European religions either stem from Sumer or stem from 
whatever civilization Sumer came from. Um, because the Sumerians definitely describe having come to Mesopotamia on a boat um, and settling there from somewhere else. Um, and it's not really clear where, um, but it's my hypothesis based on the available information that the, the map of wherever they came from is where we get the pentacle from, you know, the oh. five pointed star. Sure, yeah. Because the proto-cuneiform sign for quarters or cardinal directions, the concept of like, you know, the directions of a map is the pentagram. And that symbol, um, you know, is five pointed. And in the cuneiform tablet, the Sumerian king list, in there are a list of kings that come before the flood before they resettled in Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. and those kings rule over five cities. So if you have five cities that are existing in the civilization and you draw roads between them, you're going to get something that looks a bit like a pentagram. So I'm convinced um, it's my hypothesis. Of course, you know, more information could come out that debunks this, <laughs> but it's my hypothesis based on that that the pentagram that we all use so much in magic actually is um, a map of the world before the flood. Wow. That's brilliant. Um, definitely. It is cuneiform. Like when you write that, you are writing proto cuneiform, like the pictograph version of cuneiform because cuneiform started out as pictographs so essentially sigils like images sure that then were simplified down to be make made more easy to draw on a consistent basis and that's where you get cuneiform so every cuneiform sign is a sigil yeah yeah i was wondering um what the like patronage of you know doing this quote-unquote witchcraft with like are you gifted or shown is it you know when you're doing the headless rider you're is it like a hgh kind of situation or are you using different gods for different things all the time or is there one that kind of serves you more than others all of the above okay <laughs> so the sumerians had a concept similar to crowley's concept of the holy guardian angel mm -hmm. um but the, did it they was say hgh not... sorry <laughs> human growth hormone what? <laughs> yeah, you did. HGA. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, they had a, a concept similar, which was your personal demon, um, which kind of relates to the, the concept of the Agathos demon in Latin cultures. Um, but it, it's the idea is you have a spirit that's, like, assigned to you specifically that's, like, you are essentially their... Um, their... Uh, I've been having all sorts of trouble with words today. <laughs> oh, you and me both. Um, you are their um, apprentice. I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. You're, you're essentially their apprentice in your life, and they're like the first person you should go to when you need spiritual assistance. Um, and then the second in that chain of command would be your personal God, because you have a patron, um, a deity that's like picked you as like, you're, they're like, you're mine now kind of thing. That At least that's how it was for me with Anana. Uh -huh. And that seems to be like, f among other Sumerian reconstructionists, they seem to all describe it more or less the same way. Um, and so you have a patron deity and you have your personal god and then you have your ancestors and then there's all the other gods. So, um, and like there's a ton of different gods. There are like, thousands of gods in Sumer, but the main seven that rule the pantheon are called the seven who decree fate. And they're the ones who rule over like the big forces of nature. Okay. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, my, my wondering is, um, well, like, can you explain to me what, uh, what the ritual looks like to try to, you know, uh, converse or to, um, how do you put it? You know, I'm having trouble with words today too. <laughs> but to, uh, yeah, to converse or to um, commune, I guess. So 
what I've actually been doing in my personal practice lately, and I've been doing it for over a year now, um, is I've been working through the seven spheres, but swapped with the Sumerian seven who degree fate. Cool. And I've been using that as kind of a template, but then mixing it with, with the kind of stuff that the Sumerians would, would have done. So the way my ritual starts out is I open with a Sumerian version of the lesser banishing ritual. And I do that, um, like I essentially took that concept and rewrote it from scratch using stuff that I pulled from Sumerian tablets, stuff that I pulled from like all sorts of grimoires and stuff, just but mostly trying to make it as Sumerian as possible with the way that the Sumerians might have done it had they had that ritual. Um, there are the four winds in Sumerian, and that's they are the four cardinal winds, so the north wind, the west wind, the south wind, the east wind. They rule over the four elements, um, and that's all pulled directly from tablets. So each one has an element, each one has a god that they're, some of them, depending on which tablet you go off of the, which God goes to which, which is kind of, there's, you know, different people had different opinions on that, but each one ideally had one God and then they had an omen associated with them. So if that wind, if you were being blown on by that wind, you knew that, Hey, if it's, you know, this wind, you're probably going to have a storm. If it's this wind, it's probably going to be fine. That sort of thing. So, And so I took those four winds, which also are represented by the, the Lamasu, which are those chimeric bull, lion, eagle, man statues. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, and, and those, of course, represent a combination of the four cardinal signs, Scorpio, which in, in this case, Scorpio as the eagle form, because Scorpio has three forms. Scorpion, Eagle, and I think Phoenix is the third one. Um, So, of course, Scorpio in the Eagle form, Leo in the Lion form, Taurus in the Bull form, and Aquarius as a human. And that's kind of the mix together. And those were placed at the cardinal points of important buildings to guard them spiritually. And so, um, and those are what the form of the Four Winds, that's like the form they take. So when I'm doing the ritual and I'm calling the names of these four winds in my mind's eye, I'm picturing those giant things, you know, two stories tall showing up to stand guard of around my ritual. Cause you know how, you know, typically when you do the lesser banishing ritual, typically people picture like, you know, winged humanoid angels with like swords and stuff or whatever, yeah. or some people that they do like the tetramorphs, but I specifically am envisioning those things. And so I call on the four winds to guard the ritual. Um, And then the next thing I do is I give offerings to the deity. I do wheat beer because that was what they drank in Sumer. And I do a type of bread. I usually use crackers because it's convenient. Um, And I do a scented oil. I usually use lavender essential oil because it's my favorite scent. And yeah. if I'm going to be giving something to the gods, might as well make it be my favorite thing. <laughs> so um, I do that. And then I will read a hymn to the deity. Usually it's, I take the transliteration of the cuneiform of a hymn from Sumer and read that out. Um, the most recent one I did, I put it to music. I played my setar and, and sang the hymn um, to the That's best amazing. of my ability. Um, so I do a hymn and then I ask them for guidance and then I do a scrying session and, um, uh, depending on what time of day it is, I either use an obsidian crystal ball or a bronze mirror. Um, and usually, and that, that's kind of the point where I find out if it worked, if it worked, they'll show up in the scrying surface um, if they didn't, then they won't, and then I'll have to figure out what I did wrong. So far, I've ne- that's never happened. They've always shown up, as wow. long as I've been doing it with this format. Um, and so then I do, once that happens, I like thank them and praise them in Sumerian. <clears throat> so, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get a drink. Yeah, no problem. 
Um, and then I do a closing version of that lesser brandishing, um, which I don't like go back around in a circle and draw the pentagrams again. Instead, I just simply list everything that I listed before and use, um, so it's, it's all up on my website, Gnostic Temple of Banana, but right. I, then I go back through and say, you know, Guardian Winds, Zami, which means be praised in Sumerian. I, and I go through all of it. And of course, all of this, most of this, most of this ritual is in Sumerian, except the things that would be inconvenient <laughs> to translate, um, <clears throat> which is essentially whatever I'm saying off the cuff is going to be in English. But all the stuff I've prepared ahead of time is, is I try to do it all in Sumerian as best, to That's the best of my ability. Um, I'm, you know, not an expert on translating Sumerian, so I'm sure the translated Sumerian um, rituals that I've done are probably really grammatically incorrect and probably use some <laughs> wrong words, but hey, the gods don't seem to mind because yeah, you know, they'll take it. They're happy to be talked to at all. <laughs> yeah, probably. So anyways, then once I'm done and I've closed out the ritual, blown out the candles, all that sort of stuff. I, I like candles too. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, Do you use like color code? No, I just actually I've been using LED candles lately just for oh. fire hazard reasons because I've been doing it indoors. So I like it. <laughs> That's cool. Um, it's a good mix of the, uh, you know, the temporal time too. And I have a cow shaped candle that I light as well, which is as a substitution for a burnt cow offering. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the literal that works. Yeah, I got the idea from someone else in the in the Sumerian Reconstructionist community. So, anyways, um, so once I've I've closed out the ritual and done everything, I pour out the uh, whatever I had given as an offering. I put it outside because um, you're not supposed to reuse stuff that you've given to a deity. And I feel like it'd be kind of disrespectful to like you know pour it down the drain and throw it in the trash or something. So I put it outside, um, and then I. Um, draw whatever I saw on the scrying surface to the best of my ability. So I have a, you know, a drawing, a record of what I saw um, and that, so that, that I can look back on it and so I can remember how that deity showed themselves to me. And so I can show it to other people, Hey, this is what I saw. <laughs> Are you finding that what they showed you sometimes translates into works of art as well? Um, yeah. Well, of any sort definitely. Of I've a lot of the, the last so many articles I've written for Peach, the for the Peacock Goat Review, mm -hmm. I've uh, have largely been centered around either lessons that I learned or just like recounting my experiences of these initiations. Um, definitely, different ones have inspired me to make different things. Like when I did this the Inky one recently, I was inspired to make an idol for an Inhersog which is the goddess of nature and also Inky's consort. Um, and that's now a part of my everyday altar next to my Anana one, um, which I was inspired to make an Anana one earlier in the path. Um, These are the clay talismans. Yeah, I have, I've done that. I've done, um, and, and along with that, I've done votive figures, which are little praying people that you set in front of the idol so that they're praying to the day, you know, they're worshiping the deity even when you're not around. Um, kind of a mix on the like servitor concept. Sure. Um, I've done um, altar tiles with the star of Inanna on the Inanna one and the symbol of Ninhursag, which is a kind of weird loop-dy um, omega shape thing um, on that. Um, that's pretty much all I've done out of clay for that, other than I've made a set of essentially runes, but with cuneiform signs for divination purposes. Um, and that um, I've been doing music. I've been inspired to try and create. I'm working on an album of Sumerian hymns, um, trying to make it sound as Sumerian as possible. I got a setar. That's I've been amazing. learning how to play that. Um, and I'm supposed to be playing that at... Uh, Dayton Pagan Pride this September. So hopefully I'll be ready by then. <laughs> That's incredible. 
Um, yeah, I absolutely adore the both the customization, like the cooking aspect of bringing in a bunch of different ingredients, but also you have like such deep reverence for the things you're, you know, you're working with. It's not a lot of times, you know, I'll speak with chaos magicians or something that's very much just kind of whatever works, you know, it doesn't, uh, not really given too much reverence or care about <laughs> what I'm casting or consorting with, you know? So I've, I'm happy that both it's like this, such an intent riddled ritual, but it's also like very artistic too. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's amazing. I was going to ask you too about, you know, what, this leads into first let me just say i'm glad you're okay <laughs> you guys were ravaged by 17 tornadoes is that correct not you uh, person, i think the count's Ohio. up to 23 as of i last checked of course confirmed. the number because yeah. the the number that they were because there was uh you know when it first came out they were like okay we think there's like 11 and then they started like inspecting the damage and looking at the records and stuff. And they, the number just kept counting up for like the next couple of weeks. I think they finally stopped it on 23. That was the last number I heard. So. 23 is a very appropriate number. <laughs> of course. Um, but what I was kind of diving into was you had told me that there was ritual work used to kind of keep you safe or protect you and yours during yeah, this time. So um, I'm in a group called Lunar Cry that's on Discord. Um, it's run by... Um, I'm having the worst time with names today. <laughs> oh, it's totally cool. It's been run by Rin Collier from Where Did the Row Go? Um, and I had asked the people in that group to like do rituals and magic and stuff to protect me and my loved ones during that storm it's incredible and none of my loved ones were harmed none of their houses got hit um a couple people that i'm close to's workplaces got damaged but like they are doing okay so the, and there was a lot of places that got hit really hard but everyone yeah. that i knew was protected so i feel like that was a successful bit of magic right there so what was that like i was, was... busy hiding in the bathroom so i wasn't actually doing it i was just talking to them on All my right. laptop i had my laptop hidden in the bathroom with me. did you give them a um like a group ritual to all do in conjunction with each other or did they just kind of use their own they just did whatever they had oh that's brilliant um, whatever their practice was they just kind of did their own thing I love that. That's incredible. I mean, technology, right? <laughs> What's really weird about that whole scenario is two things. One, the, almost exactly 24 hours before that storm, my girlfriend had seen a faceless thing in the window looking into our apartment. Um, she didn't get a good look at it. It was from across the apartment, but there was it definitely wasn't a person, and there was no way we're on a second story so there's no way any person could have easily gotten up there without a ladder and you'd hear a ladder so yeah um what's your and then assumption i well <laughs> so then later that day or well the, the next day but before the storms hit <coughs> excuse me let me get another drink my throat's really scratchy today so Earlier in the day that the storms actually hit, I had done a divination with the Sumerian Oracle deck, trying to figure out what that faceless thing was. I don't remember all the cards, but I remember in the near future position was the card Ishkur, who is the god of storms. Mm -hmm. And then later that very same day, we got hit by all these tornadoes and storms. <laughs> and I feel like that was kind of you know, a warning to me, hey, right. you should probably pay attention to this. And honestly, I probably wouldn't have been paying as much attention to the storms had it not been for that card showing up. Um, because we do get thunderstorms a lot around here in Ohio, and most of the time they're nothing to be worried about. So a lot of times I just kind of tend to ignore those alerts and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I was paying more attention because of that, and as a result, we were safe. Or I feel incredible. like, as, at least partially as a result, we were safe. We were we had made a point of being home. 
So, is there a faceless type deity in Sumerian that kind of perked your ears when you heard that? There, there is, but I don't think, I don't think this thing was it, because the faceless thing is um, Alu. I hope I'm pronouncing that right which is essentially, so when humanity was created in the Sumerian mythology, they needed essentially a spirit and a life source to put into the clay statues to create humanity. And so the god Wela, who was the god of intelligence, volunteered, well, or was not, or was volunteered, depending on which tablet you go off of. If you go off the later tablets, was volunteered. Earlier ones seem to be volunteered of his own volition. But in any case, was sacrificed to have his, like, you know, life force put into these statues to create humanity. Well, when that happened, he had a ghost. And his ghost became a hungry ghost mm -hmm. and wanted its body back, essentially. And that hungry ghost is Alu. And it, and it is the shadow thing, the faceless shadow thing. That is the thing when people have sleep paralysis. Oh, yeah. At least some of the time. The shadow people? And, the Yeah, um, the most violent one. Ooh, like an incubus almost. Yeah, the well, the specifically the faceless one that tries to like kill you, um, and that was their explanation for what that was, um, you know. And of course, me being a Sumerian structuralist, I assume they're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in any case, Alu is you know a faceless thing, but Alu wouldn't warn you about a storm. Alu yeah. wouldn't have anything to do with storms. Alu would show up in the middle of the night and try to basically choke you to death. Yeah. It's and not his rip purview. Your, rip your spirit out of your body so that it can have its body back, basically. Yeah, yeah. it's his Tuesday. So I don't think it was Alu. So what was it? I have no idea. Um, I feel like if anyone's going to figure that out, it's going to be my girlfriend. After all, she was the one who seen it. Right, right. But she was kind of terrified by it, so I don't think she even wants to know. <laughs> yeah. So regardless, it was something that definitely played into all that drama. Yeah, that's it's just amazing to me that there was some like herald, you know, before the storm bringing it or something because you know, that was a magnanimously like well, epic, you know, a lot situation. of people, including myself, are speculating that the storms came as a punishment to Dayton for like two weeks earlier. Dayton allowed a KKK rally to happen mm. now. the response of the people who actually live in Dayton rather than these people that came in from the outside to do this absurd rally. I don't know why the Dayton government ever let that happen. They should have arrested them all as being terrorists because that's what the KKA is. But anyways, um, the, you know, the people who actually lived in Dayton um, pretty much overwhelmingly came out to, you know, counter protest. There were like something like 2000, counter protesters to like 20 people that that were supposed to show up in the kk okay and of that like nine actually showed up oh really yeah it was like that's way good. overwhelming but i like you know to have that happen and then be followed up you know two weeks later by these crazy tornadoes that are like we've never had that in the history of ohio we we have tornadoes occasionally but they're never that many in one place at one time yeah people have been suspecting that it was punishment for letting that rally ever happen. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's kind of unfair because the people who actually live here were kind of against it. Yeah. It's just the government that let it happen because they couldn't, they weren't willing to actually classify the KKK as a terrorist group, which I don't know why. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, I mean, I suspect that it's because probably some of the people in the government are racist trash, but oh, whatever, absolutely. that's getting political. I don't <laughs> want to really talk about that. The, the point is a lot of people have been speculating that that's the case, and I even kind of made a joke about it on, on my Twitter account. <laughs> yeah. How, did, how was that received? Um, 
I think most people just kind of ignored it. <laughs> yeah. Story of my life. Yeah. But um, if someone, how would somebody kind of begin a foray into this? Like say I wanted to incorporate some of this into my own uh, ritual work or daily ritual work. Oh, that's complicated. Um, unfortunately, right now, there's not a lot of really good books. There's certainly none for a practitioner. Um, there's one that's the Temple of Sumer is working on putting out one out that should be out later this year. I'm working on one myself, but that's going to take even longer because um, what I'm doing is I'm collecting um, tablets on magic practices from from the Sumerians and Babylonians um, and trying to compile a book that has, you know, as much of that as I can get my hands on plus commentaries of my own comparing it to modern practices and especially medieval grimoires mm -hmm. um, and, and the Pyre Greca Magicae. Um, so that's a book I'm working on. It's really slow progress because it's a lot of, you know, really in-depth research and having to buy really expensive college level textbooks. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's a slow progress. Um, but the Temple of Sumer book should be out this year. It's supposed to be out this year, assuming it doesn't get delayed again to put yet more content in it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but unfortunately right now there's not a lot of really good resources. The biggest things are I would recommend getting a content, a copy of the literature of ancient Sumer um, by Oxford University Press. Um, it is probably the best collection of Sumerian mythology and hymns and texts translated that I am aware of. Mm -hmm. It has tons and tons and tons of material. Um, I liked it so much I bought two copies. <laughs> yeah. This is, the, I have a paperback and a hardback copy. So I bought the paperback first, and I was like, I need a hardback of this. This is this. I, I need one that stays nice. <laughs> yeah. I know all um, my books are wrecked. <laughs> so that one's that one's really good. Um, also, I have my own website, uh, Gnostic Temple of Anana dot mm -hmm. org, and that has everything that I've put together that isn't in the Peacock Goat Review. Um, and I'm probably going to start putting up old Peacock Goat Review articles on there as well eventually. I have to run that by Aaron, make sure he's cool with it. <laughs> How's that going so far? You guys launched that, what, uh, this past year? Yeah, it, it started at the end of last year, I believe. Um, and we've gotten quite a few out now. Um, I think we're on like our eighth issue. I have a stack of them right here. <laughs> Yeah, they look beautiful. Think, oh, they the remind one that just me. came out was volume eight. It's been steady progress. Yeah. Um, and, and what's really interesting about it is it seems like more often than not, we don't talk about we're writing what well, we're writing ahead of time. We each just kind of write whatever is on our mind, whatever we're going through, whatever we whatever we feel led to write. Mm -hmm. And yet, almost every single time, the issue has a topic that everyone kind of weighs in on all completely done at random like it was it's like synchronicity has made right. almost every issue <laughs> have a topic and yet none of it was discussed ahead of time we all just wrote whatever we wanted to write <laughs> there's no restrictions on what you can write about he just you know aaron is the final authority on everything but essentially mm -hmm. as long as it's there's nothing wrong with the article he you know you know, he, he, he picks and chooses what articles to publish, but usually of the people that it got it, of the people who are writers for the magazine, um, usually he just kind of goes with whatever. I mean, I've, I've never had him turn any of my articles down, so yeah. <laughs> put it that way. It's a good so, record. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so commendable, you guys doing print. I love that. With We the Hallowed, we, uh, we did a print kind of zine. It was more of like a little literary journal. And the idea was to do it at least every couple of months. We got one out and we're so <laughs> tired after getting, you know, setting all that stuff up. So it's always commendable to see people, you know, push the print and miss it. Yeah, I definitely think it's a good product. Um, and I love to see it grow. Um, I, I very much think it's something that we need more stuff like that in the community, more yeah. you know, less talking heads of people who, 
you know, put out all these big thick books of like how to's that are probably mostly just stolen from other books totally. <laughs> and more like people talking about their actual experiences and stuff. And that, that's one thing that I love about the, the magazine is other than just my own articles, like ignoring my own involvement, like just hearing other perspectives from all different paths and seeing what everyone's own take on whatever it is is really interesting because you know we have a whole bunch of different writers from all different paths like i'm the only sumerian reconstructionist in the group like yeah. everyone else is on completely different paths so you know how is the sumerian reconstructionist like community what's that like um there is basically one big name in the game <laughs> um and there's other groups you? but they're small no no <laughs> well i'm kind of part of it like i'm yeah. I participate and stuff but the big name is the temple of sumer um and they are the biggest group they're the oldest group they've been around for longer than anyone else um and they have some of the best information and they have like actual academics that have you know phds and stuff in the group um who study this stuff as, as you know, their full-time job. So it is the best resource and I would highly recommend anyone who is interested in these topics, definitely try and join the Temple of Sumer Facebook group. It is a great group of people. They are really helpful answering questions, pointing you to information, providing resources. Their website is pretty informative, although it's kind of being rebuilt at the moment. Um, but definitely they are a great group of people and especially once the book comes out it's going to be a huge and important resource it'll i think it'll be kind of the the book that will set the standard for all of sumerian reconstructionism at least for the next couple of decades yeah, that's exciting how's the uh how's incantations and butterflies going um it's slow um but i had always planned on it being something I'm doing when I'm passionate about something. I don't want to force out episodes every week if I can't actually deliver ones that I feel like are worth doing. Totally. Um, I never really created it with the intention of being successful. I created it with the intention of creating something that I wanted to exist. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the purest way to do it. That's very much the kind of thing that it is. And I've kind of avoided paying too much attention to stats or what anyone has to say about it because I kind of just want it to be from the heart. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole reason why I did this was for a direct line to talk to people such as yourself, you know, to learn more and to do more as a practitioner too. So it's always like, I, I just have found no other better way than to like, you know, uh, generate uh, an academia for myself in this <laughs> regard, you know. But yeah, um, when you were on, I think I heard you on Nox Mente. Uh, that was like my introduction to Nox Mente. It's a cool podcast. I like the whole <laughs> same thing. But you were talking like you had a whole system for documenting dreams. Uh, yeah, so I use this app. I've been using it for years before I even got into magic. I originally started using it just cu out of curiosity and also mostly for health reasons because it links up to Samsung Health. It's mm -hmm. called Sleep as Android. And there's a settings that you can set that when your alarm goes off, um, that it will make you type in your dream before you can turn the alarm off. Um, Sleep as I've been, Android? Mm -hmm, it's for Android phones. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I've been using it for years and it forces you to write down your dream before you wake up um, before, I mean, before you can turn off the alarm. And, um, and I also use it to record my sleep cycles and stuff. So I have years worth of sleep data from that, including dream entries and all that sort of stuff. So are you seeing, you know, some of your deities and the people that you work with, they're, they're popping up in your dreams. Are you seeing a lot of like direct correlation from these hypnagogic states and dreams? Is there like, oh, do you think there's like a, a certain realm or a trans-dimensional place you're hitting that kind of mixes both? Well, um, 
That's a lot of questions in one. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so to answer the first one, um, yes, I've had deities show up. I've had symbols from some Sumer showed up. I've had all sorts of stuff show up. Um, I've also had a lot, way more than deity showing up. I've had a lot that correlate with whatever I'm doing in magic. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, my dreams are kind of my first warnings, my early warning system for anything I'm doing magically. I pay close attention to them and look for, you know, recognizable signs and stuff. Um, and, and interpreting my dreams has been a huge part of my magic practice because it gives me an idea of where I'm at, what's going on around me, all that sort of stuff. Um, now I forget what the other parts of the question were. Like, are you finding that you're uh, visiting kind of the same places? There are definitely a few places that I, that are reoccurring. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's definitely also some other like archetypes that tend to repeat a lot. Um, I don't know how to interpret that just that yeah. it's a thing that happens um a lot of times i'll have dreams that tend that turn out to be um premonitory in some way either i will literally dream a thing and then it'll happen and i'll get that deja vu feeling yeah. or it will be something where it's kind of encoded um in the symbols That's um neat. So, for example, one reoccurring dream that I had that had symbols that ended up being premonitory was I had, over the course of like three weeks, I had the same dream like three times of being in a museum. It was like a a museum full of trains, and I would go out this hallway. And I think in the first version, I just went outside and that was it. Um, the second version I went outside and I was on a roller coaster and the third version I went outside and I was on like a unicycle on a track (laughs) or something like that. And it ended up relating to my then relationship, which was initially, you know, it started off and it was kind of okay and it seemed nice. (laughs) Then it became a crazy roller coaster and then it kind of mellowed out and ended Um, so that was kind of, you know, my dream's way of telling me about this relationship and where it was headed. Um, are there any texts that you use or you go to for reference and kind of the dream symbology or are you, is this just kind of a self-interpretation? It's mostly self-interpretation. I tend to look for, um, symbols that i recognize from magical practices especially yeah. mythological symbolism and and archetypes um i also look to carl jung a lot um yeah. and his things um and also just things that i'm familiar with and also i tend to look at um like crowley's work a lot i seem, yeah. seem to, i seem to have like either scenarios from the Thoth deck or things that I've recognized from um, the Book of Lies, and especially, like, anytime numbers show up in my dreams, my f- go-to is usually, assuming they're numbers that, are, that there's a poem for in the Book of Lies, I tend to look at that, because that tends to have some insight. Yeah. And as far as, like, your, like, the, is there a Sumerian astrology that's, like, uh, able to study and so the sumerians kind of did use the stars for some things they had a system of omens but it wasn't really formalized into the babylonians but the babylonians had more or less what we think of as hellenistic astrology was Mm. mostly babylonian of an origin they had i mean of course the greeks had their own twist and their own like stuff but for the most part that comes originally from the babylonian so i do look at astrology some but i haven't really put all that much effort into learning it yeah and honestly the biggest thing is if i'm if slash when i go to do that i want it to be the babylonian astrology as well as i can put together um i do um i i do use this um babylonian 
or I'm not sure if it's Babylonian or Sumerian, but it's a big, huge tablet that has a list of lucky and unlucky days for each of the Babylonian months. And I've kind of reconstructed the Babylonian calendars, sort of, based on the astrological signs that show up in each Babylonian month, because each month was supposed to be one sign. Mm. Um, so I've kind of put together this like reconstructed calendar system, and I wrote up a script, and it's on my website. If you go to the calendar page, it, that is the calendar, um, and it and it has the list of lucky and unlucky days. Um, and then a list of things that that month is astrologically good for. And so anything that I'm doing, that's one of the things that can show up on that list. I would refer to that as a guide. Um, I also tend to mix in the, um, I'm not, I th- I'm not sure where it originated, but the idea of like the planetary days and hours, right. I tend to mix that in a lot. Um, but I've swapped it somewhat because I use the Sumerian seven who decree fate instead of the typical um, Roman associations. Mm -hmm. So I go off of that. Um, And especially if I'm going to work with a specific spirit, I will try and use, so in the Sumerian Oracle deck, they eat all of the, uh, there's, well, there are two types of cards. There's the, the black cards and the gray cards. The gray cards are mostly like um, more, um, not so much spirits as like the Tablet of Destinies, Kor, um, Iridu, different like non non spirit spiritual. You know what I mean? Non spirits. Yeah. Um, although I think there's a few that are mixed in with that. But anyways. As for the black ones, which are all the spirits, if I'm going to, you know, work with the spirit, uh, meaning a god, a demon, uh, any of that, um, I will look at its Sumerian Oracle deck card, if there is one. And so the the black cards are sorted into seven suits based on the seven who degree fate. And so there's symbols for each one on the card, and then a number. They're given a number, one to seven. And so I refer to the Sumerian Oracle deck card and I use whichever of the seven who decree fate is on it. I use that to place it in the planetary hours and days Um, and use. So for example, if it's a Nana, I'm going to be using the day and hour of Venus. Mm -hmm. Um, If the one is, you know, Utu, God of the sun, then I'm going to be using day and hour of the sun. So whichever symbol is on the card, that's the one I'm going to be using to contact that spirit. Um, there's no real historicity to that organization other than whatever the person who made the uh, Samaritan or- Oracle deck put in, but it seems to work for me. So I'm just using it. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm super interested in kind of investigating that as far as uh, like a chart situation too. Cause you said unlucky days in the month and all that. And it's like perked yeah, my ears. Um, of, oh, maybe I was. Born if you're interested in looking at it, just go to uh, GnosticTempleOfAnana.org and click on the calendar page. And I've got a script that'll let you, you know, you can click forward and back, look at next month. It'll show you what day you're on in the current month. And it has those symbols from the cards at the top for the days of the week. Um, That's awesome. I'm really proud of that thing that I no, put it's together. Incredible. <laughs> it's like so thorough. I love it. So what's in the future? What's coming up? I know you had mentioned in September there's a you're you're going to be playing some music at a pagan. Uh, yeah, Dayton venture. Pagan Pride. Very cool. Um, like I said, I'm working on that book slowly. Yeah. I have no release date. I have no anything. It's going to be done when it's done. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, that may take years. That may take months. However long it takes, I'm not going to put a deadline on it. I'm going to let it be done when it feels like it's ready. Um, other than that, I'm slowly making updates to the Gnostic Temple Banana website as I create more things and do more stuff and learn more and all that sort of stuff. Um, I have an album I'm working on slowly. Um, that should be out before September, hopefully. Um, and it's going to be Sumerian hymns. You have some music posted too, right? Somewhere. Yeah, I have a Bandcamp page, vnessie.bandcamp.com. Very cool. 
and Peacock Goat reviews going strong. I'm sure you're going to yeah. be in every issue you're in. Um, I am so far. Mm-hmm. So assuming nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing. And thank you so much for taking the time. And, you know, I appreciate you putting up with my unprofessionality. <laughs> Because you're such a podcast maverick. I think you've hit, like, every one I listen to pretty much. <laughs> yeah, every time I think I'm, I've am i been, you know, on all the podcasts I'm going to be on, I end up getting asked to do another one. So. Yeah. Well, hope this definitely won't be the last, I hope. Uh, get you back on later, especially around. I would love to hear more about the Dayton Pride Festival, too. I think that's such a cool idea. It's going to be my first pagan festival full stop. So <laughs> a little bit nervous, but I've done public performances before. I used to be in a band, a rock yeah. band. So Very cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the music situation, the writing the Sumerian hymns, is I, I'm so interested in that. I can't wait to hear what comes Do my that. best in pronouncing Sumerian words. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like no one... You've never heard it really said appropriately, right? There's there's really only one attempt that I'm familiar with, and I've kind of been inspired by him. On YouTube, there's Peter Pringle put out a video. He actually has a gishgudi, which is the Sumerian musical instrument, which the setar is the modern like descendant of. Um, and he did his attempt on doing just like the first four or five lines of the epic of, of the one of the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh tablets. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really beautiful. I recommend everyone check that out. Um, but no one's really tried to do it on any kind of scale and certainly not um, like, like his video is just, you know, him singing and playing the Gishkudi. I'm going to like include drums and stuff and maybe even uh, try to do a flute. Um, very cool. I wish I knew more people interested. I would kind of like to put a band together, but. <laughs> well, if you need anything from across the country. <laughs> That's not really going to help, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I could email you some drum parts or something, you know, do it that way. But that Well, that's it would have to be, you know, yeah. Sumerian instruments. <laughs> right. Right, and you because you wanted to get it as close to yeah, I want to try and recapture what that might have sounded like the best I can. And the plan is, I might have to change it though, depending on what I can find, because I think I've kind of hit a roadblock on a couple of them. But the idea is to have a, an album with seven tracks, and each one being a hymn to one of the seven who degree fate. Okay. So, kind of like almost a Holtz planets, but with Sumerian <laughs> deities. There's that seven again. I have definitely been moved to put seven tracks on records. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's a pretty uh, major number too in Sumerian, right? And... Yeah, um, definitely. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on. Of course, yeah. And stay in touch. I'll uh, get all the pertinent links and everything down in the description, all that fancy stuff. I'll make you a real fancy introduction so it doesn't just <laughs> come into the my really bad introduction. <laughs> well, thank you. Have uh, a good rest of your night. Yeah, you too. Yeah, stay safe. Keep punching those tornadoes. <laughs> I think I'm going to continue hiding from them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Punching them with magic, I mean, you know. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have a good one.